Here is a bulletin from NB. I slug it. Number six. We're in the top of the third. On the evening of May 13, 1977, two men waited in a car outside the home of Mickey Spillane. They were there to deliver a message to the head of the Irish mob. The death of Mickey Spillane marked the end of an era. The day of the gentleman gangster was over and the reign of terror was about to begin. Mickey Spillane was known as the gentleman gangster. He may not have been as brutal or as ferocious as some of the gangsters that preceded him or those that came after him, but he was certainly no saint. There's very much the legend and then there's what's real. And we live in such a black and white world. And there's a whole lot of gray out there. And there are people like my dad who walked in the gray. And they were needed, because if there wasn't somebody like him in this neighborhood, standing his ground, there were 80 people outside this neighborhood that would have loved to come in and taken over. No neighborhood is more significant in the development of the Irish-American gangster than Hell's Kitchen on the west side of Manhattan in New York City. The Irish had used that neighborhood as a base of power. They had criminal influence there, and they also had political influence there through the local Democratic Party Association. New York is made up of all little villages, you know, and Hell's Kitchen would be just a village. And we all knew each other and, uh, you know, we took care of each other. It was into this world that Mickey and his twin brother were born on July 13, 1934. They were the youngest of seven children. Their father, John Spillane, was an Irish immigrant who had come to America from County Kerry. He settled in New York, and he raised a family, but he didn't live to see the twins grow up. His dad died when he was nine. Most of his older siblings were off fighting World War II at the time. It was 1943, you know, 44. So you had these, you know, two nine-year-old twins running around with really no guidance. They lived in 48th Street. We lived in 49th Street. So I knew Mike when he was very young. Mike was you know, like every other kid on 10th Avenue. You know, you'd be tough if you had to be tough. I mean, uh, I was tough when I had to be tough. You know, because you couldn't back down. You know, if you back down, then, then you'd be pushed around all over the place. So you just uh, stand there and fight. Mickey Spillane, as a teenager, like a lot of kids in that neighborhood, was just a, a young guy who could occasionally get himself into trouble. At the age of 16 or 17, I believe it was, he tried to rob a movie theater in nearby Times Square. The Times Square neighborhood is right alongside of Hell's Kitchen. Spillane wanted to move up in the world, and this was his chance to show the Irish mob that he had what it took to become a gangster. There was a cop there, and, and, you know, back then they had what they called the fleeing felon law, where if a cop said stop and you didn't, they could open fire. And he shot my dad in the back, and my dad fell underneath the marquee of a movie theater that read The Thief. And it was on the front page of the Daily News, and, and it went out on the AP wire and actually went all over the country. Spillane was in all the newspapers, and his name was on everyone's lips in Hell's Kitchen. But he wouldn't be around to take advantage of his newfound fame. As a result of the robbery, Spillane spent time in hospital and four years in prison. Prisons were like colleges for thieves and criminals, and Mickey Spillane was an attentive student. On his release from prison, Spillane was a changed man.
by the 1950s, the rackets in the neighborhood had died out quite a bit. This was the era in which the, the waterfront began to die out uh, as a source of uh, commerce and a source of plunder for the mob. And so Mickey Spillane found himself in a criminal environment that wasn't quite as lucrative as it had once been. And yet, that framework of the criminal organization still existed in that neighborhood. The little profit that was now being made in the West Side was going into the pocket of local bookmaker, Huey Mulligan. Mulligan was involved in loan sharking and gambling, but he wasn't as such a very greedy man. By now, the Irish mob was at a low ebb. The Italians were taking control around Hell's Kitchen, and money could be made by people who were willing to stand against them. Mickey Spillane was one of those people. First, Spillane had to re-establish himself on the west side, and he soon came to the attention of Huey Mulligan. My dad, what he did one time was he, he robbed the payroll from the peers, and, you know, nobody would have the guts to rob the payroll from the peers. And, you know, that was controlled by people like Huey Mulligan. And, and nobody knew exactly for sure it was my dad, but Huey had his suspicions, and Huey actually really liked the fact that this guy had the guts to do that, and he hired my dad. People started to see that Spillane had a, a certain something that maybe the average criminal didn't have. He was a handsome young guy. He was very respectful of people in the neighborhood. He didn't act like a, a street tough, although he was perfectly capable of operating within that world. He had more polish than the average criminal. People saw that he was someone who was quite possibly capable of leading the rackets in the neighborhood. Mickey Spillane was going from strength to strength, and his leadership credentials were further bolstered when he married Maureen McManus. The McManus family, known in the neighborhood as the McManai, had ruled the Hell's Kitchen uh, Democratic Club going back to 1902. My sister, who was always like the princess of the neighborhood, you know, my father's only daughter, my father wasn't too happy uh, about the marriage. In fact, he said that, you know, he's going to break a heart. My mother was very much, you know, the pride of the McManuses. She was the queen of Hell's Kitchen. And my dad, because of his good looks and his charms, was really the king. So it's only kind of, you know, made sense that they met. People outside of uh, the neighborhood might have a hard time understanding how a preeminent racketeer and criminal figure in the neighborhood marries into the preeminent political family in the neighborhood. But this is the American story in, in Hell's Kitchen and in New York City and so many large urban environments in the United States. This was the process by which not only the Irish, but by which most immigrant communities moved up and out of the ghetto and achieved what we call the American dream. And, and so having uh, this, this symbiotic relationship between the political element and the criminal element was not a strange thing in Hell's Kitchen. It was not necessarily even anything to hide or be ashamed of. One of the old timers told me that he actually went to my dad's wedding and he was dancing and he said to his date, he said, you see that guy on the dance floor? He's a judge. And his girlfriend said, how do you know? And he said, because he sent me to jail. <laughs> now that he was a married man, Spillane promised his wife that he would leave the criminal life behind him. Well, when he married my sister, he promised Maureen that he would get out of all that and get a legitimate job. So he worked at construction for three or four months. As a wire lather, do you know what they do? They turn the wire. That's all they do all day long. They turn wire, clipping the metal uh, rods together. Mike was no boob. You know, he was smart. You know, if he went another way in his life, which he didn't have an opportunity to, you know, uh, he'd be CEO of some great corporation. Too bad uh, if you had a criminal record, you know, you, you, you couldn't get a decent job anywhere. 
Before long, Mickey Spillane was back on the streets, and it wasn't long before he was running Hell's Kitchen. Spillane modelled himself on some of the old Irish bosses, like Oni Madden. He was always well-dressed, cheerful when he was with people, and always helped the locals. I remember the feeling that, you know, everybody liked him. Um, everybody would come over to say hello. And, and, you know, through a child's mind, you know, you think, of course, that's my dad. Um, hindsight, I realized that, you know, most were coming over to ask for favors or, you know, just to say hello because of possible future favors. By the early 60s, Spillane had a gang of loyal followers that were headed by his good friend, Eddie Comiskey. It was a good time for the Irish in America. In Washington, John F. Kennedy was inaugurated into the White House. And in the west side of Manhattan, Mickey Spillane ruled from his own White House, the White House Bar, which he opened in 1960. But there was trouble looming for both men. You don't get to take over anything by being a nice guy all the time. You know, I think it's the reality of the world. You know, I, I, when you're in that business and, and you, you know, you're dealing with tough people, you have to be tough. By the 60s, Mickey Spillane ruled the Irish mob in the West Side, but he was an old-style gangster. Society was changing fast, but the same couldn't be said about Spillane's operation. By now, the underworld had changed in the major cities of the United States. Drugs were coming to the fore with huge money to be made. Mickey Spillane had no interest in drugs, but one of the people who understood the fortune that could be made from them was a man who had vowed to seek revenge against Spillane, Jimmy Coonan. Jimmy Coonan had a beef against Mickey Spillane that went back deep into his childhood. Supposedly, Mickey Spillane had kidnapped Jimmy Coonan's father, John Coonan, and had held him for ransom in the basement of the White House bar, which was Mickey Spillane's bar on 45th Street and 10th Avenue. And in the course of holding John Coonan, supposedly they tied him to a chair and pistol whipped him, and John Coonan was eventually released, but the humiliation that John Coonan had experienced was passed along to Jimmy Coonan, and Jimmy Coonan held a, a grudge against Mickey Spillane that would become a, a motivating factor in Jimmy Coonan's attempts to challenge Mickey Spillane's authority in the neighborhood. The whole world was changing. The whole sense of community was being lost. Um, and I think some of the younger guys that were coming up were very much involved in drugs. You know, there was a big economic decay here in New York City in the 70s. Everything was drying up, except for this drug trade. And, you know, the, the people that were standing in the way of this movement were, you know, very much people like my dad. And I think my dad's way of life was becoming a dinosaur. And dinosaurs become extinct. By the mid-60s, Coonan had formed his own gang to rival Spillane's operation, and soon the two factions were involved in a war for control of Hell's Kitchen. There was violence, there was killings, there was shootings in the street, there was a kind of a violent intimidation that really engulfed the whole neighborhood. The uh, young criminals, they were all hopped up, started shooting people. You know, where drugs hit, you had violence. Drugs were sweeping through Hell's Kitchen, and they were making Coonan's gang more crazed. Coonan was paranoid, and he hired Eddie Sullivan, a local gangster, as his personal bodyguard. Coonan believed that Spillane had hired professional assassins to kill him and his followers. They thought that they saw two of these in the Pussycat Lounge on the east side of New York. But Jimmy Coonan was mistaken, and he would pay dearly for it. Coonan and his associate took these two men 
drove them out of Manhattan into the neighborhood of Queens, stood them up against the wall in Queens, and shot them. One of the men they shot survived and was able to identify Jimmy Coonan as the shooter. So Jimmy Coonan wound up doing time for this shooting and was removed from the neighborhood for a while. Even though Coonan was out of the neighborhood at this time, Mickey Spillane still had a lot of trouble because of his rivalry with the mafia in New York. Uh, this rivalry came to a head around the construction of a major convention center on the west side of Manhattan called the Jacob Javits Center. A project of this size was worth a fortune, but nothing was going on in the city without the Italians knowing about it. The Genovese family had struggled with the Irish mob for years for control of Hell's Kitchen. With the Jacob Javits Center on the horizon, the Italians were determined to end Spillan's reign. The head of the Genovese family, Tony Salerno, decided to forget about Mickey Spillan and he began attacking his strongest and most powerful henchmen. Over the course of about a year and a half, Spillane's three closest associates were murdered in New York City. And Spillane began to get a sense that these murders were coming closer and closer to him and that he might be next on the list. Spillane was cornered and there was more to come. After 10 years, an old enemy was about to return to the streets of Hell's Kitchen. Jimmy Coonan comes back to the neighborhood in 1976 when he gets out of prison and he picks up where he left off with his rivalry with Mickey Spillane, but since he's been out of the neighborhood now for a while, he has to begin to uh, rebuild power. And so Jimmy Coonan begins to uh, forge a relationship with a capo in the Gambino crime family by the name of Roy DeMeo. Mickey Spillane was now fighting a war on two fronts. He didn't have many options left. He decided to leave Hell's Kitchen before it was too late. When we moved out to Queens, I felt like the reason was um, it, it was a nicer apartment, the schools were nicer, the area was nicer. You know, I didn't find out until later, you know, the real reasons why we had moved out, which is because, you know, the, the walls, so to speak, were kind of closing in on my dad, and he really wanted to protect us and took us out there. That crowd, you know, uh, they were threatening to kill Maureen and the kids, you know. Uh, and she got very sick. The fear she, she was constant under of possibly some nut going shooting her kids. And today she's still not well. You know, uh, you know, she on medication all her life, you know, because of uh, fear. Hey, Tony, what's, what's With Spillane gone from the west side, Jimmy Coonan was able to use his Italian contacts to take control, but he still wasn't happy. As Jimmy Coonan tells Roy DeMeo, you know, I can be boss of the neighborhood, but I'll never really be boss of the neighborhood as long as Mickey Spillane's still alive. Mike came to the club, but he wouldn't come into the club because he'd be afraid of being trapped. It wasn't this when it was down 49th Street. And so I went outside and he said, Jim, uh, I'm mocked. He says, uh, I can't find who's after me. He said, just see if you can help me find out. Let me sit down with them. We'll work something out. That was Mike. We'll work something out. For Spillane's enemies, the time for talking was over. And on May 13th, 1977, they moved against him. My brother and I were watching TV with him, and he had said that um, a friend was stopping by. So it, it was late at night, it was about 11 o'clock. And I was in the kitchen getting a glass of milk and the buzzer rang. 
and the uh, voice on the buzzer said, is Mike there? And, and by then, my dad was next to me, and he, he leaned into the box and said, I'll be right down. So he said, good night, son. And he walked out, and I never saw him again. Spillane headed down to the street unarmed and walked over to the car to talk to whoever it was that was there, and he was shot five times by someone sitting in the car, and he died in the street in front of his apartment in Woodside. My sister had come home and said to my brother, who was still on the couch, somebody was killed in front of the building. And my brother said, Dad left a half hour ago, said he'd be back in five minutes. Um, so I, I think that that's when we knew that it was Dad. Mike was a good guy, overall. You know, none of us are angels. You know, he probably uh, took care of more people in his lifetime than, uh, than he hurt. The best way I can put this is um, my Uncle Jim, my dad, Huey Mulligan, Oni Madden, they did their job, and their job worked. And their job was to take the poor immigrant Irish, move them up to working class, move them up to middle class. When they got to middle class, they did what they were supposed to do, and they moved out. So what was left was a void and a handful of us that saw the end. The removal of Mickey Spillane ushered in a whole new era of organized crime on the west side of Manhattan. It also represented the passing of a certain type of cultural tradition, that type of a racketeer that was connected to the semi-legitimate spheres of influence in the neighborhood had now been removed. It was uh, the death of a certain kind of criminal culture that had existed in the criminal underworld in New York City going back 100 years. The death of Mickey Spillane marked the end of an era. Now, Jimmy Coonan and his crew had complete control of the West Side in New York. A reign of terror was about to begin, the reign of the Westies. The bloodthirsty Westies gang. Notorious West Side gang known as the Westies. They not only kill people, but they dismember them. The Westies is an Irish-American gang that's dominated organized crime in the Hell's Kitchen area of Manhattan for decades. In New York in the 1980s, a crew of Irish gangsters emerged as one of the most feared gang of killers the city had ever seen. They were called the Westies and were led by the wildest Westie of them all. Jimmy Coonan. The death of Mickey Spillane, the head of the Irish mob, in May 1977 was the end of an era, which finally gave power to Jimmy Coonan and the Westies to take over the West Side. Mickey Spillane, always thought of as kind of a gentleman gangster in the neighborhood, had now been removed. And so now we're into a whole new generation of gangsterism on the west side of Manhattan, led by the likes of Jimmy Coonan. Jimmy Coonan was finally running things on the west side, but it had taken him a long time to take over from Spillane. Their rivalry had begun 20 years earlier, when Jimmy Coonan was still a teenager in Hell's Kitchen. Coonan was unlike the other famous criminals who preceded him. His father was an accountant, and the family had a comfortable upbringing. But the Spillane-Coonan war went back years, when Spillane and his gang had badly beaten Coonan's father. Supposedly, Mickey Spillane had kidnapped Jimmy Coonan's father, John Coonan, and had held him for ransom. And Jimmy Coonan's uh, deep resentment about the way that his father was treated by Mickey Spillane gave birth to what became known as the Coonan-Spillane Wars. At the height of the Coonan-Spillane Wars in the 1960s, Coonan was sent to prison for 10 years. Prison transformed Coonan into a tougher and smarter criminal, and he emerged back onto the streets, determined to take over the Hell's Kitchen rackets 
and have his revenge on Mickey Spillane. After his release from prison, Coonan took over the 596 Club on 10th Avenue, and he and his crew used it as their headquarters. Nearby was the White House Bar, which was Mickey Spillane's base. Coonan began luring some of Spillane's top men, one of whom, perhaps the most important one, was Eddie Comiskey. Eddie Comiskey had a special talent that made him revered in the criminal underworld in the neighborhood, and that was that when he was in prison, he had trained to be a butcher. And he'd come back to the neighborhood, and he'd used this talent to make bodies disappear, to make murder victims disappear. He actually cut up the body, put the body parts in plastic bags, and dumped them in the East River. Jimmy Coonan saw the value in what Kaminsky was able to do in the sense that in the era before DNA, if you had no body, you had no criminal investigation. No corpus delecti, no investigation, is how Jimmy Coonan put it. Coonan and Comiskey cemented their relationship when they murdered a rival Hell's Kitchen gangster named Paddy Dugan. Kaminsky and Coonan lure Paddy Dugan to a neighborhood apartment and they shoot him and kill him. And so they have the various uh, body parts that they need to dispose of. And what they do is they cross over a couple of rooftops to another building and they're descending the stairwell of that building down to the 596 Club. As they're descending down the stairway, Jimmy Coonan's niece sees them with the various bags. She sees them holding one bag that looks like a, a basketball, but what it is is Patty Dugan's head in a plastic garbage bag. It was to the kitchen of the 596 Club that Coonan and Comiskey brought Paddy Dugan's body for disposal. The Irish mob under the Coonan really became violent. In fact, more violent than the Italians did. We had one guy named Vito Arena who became an informant for us, and he told us how they would cut bodies up. He sat there in our office when he became an informant, and he would tell us how they would do it. He says the easiest part was the head. It was like snapping a pencil. Then he said the toughest thing was to cut through the grizzle in the elbow. We're sitting there eating lunch, and it was like everybody had to leave the room and throw up. One thing they did, when they killed somebody and they dismembered them, they cut their hands off and froze their hands. The frozen hands would prove to be very useful at a later date, when they would defrost them slightly and use their fingerprints to leave at the scene of a crime. Paddy Dugan's brutal murder was a sign of the levels of violence that would become a trademark of the Westies' bloody reign. The violence was escalating, and nobody was safe on the streets of Hell's Kitchen. In 1977, Coonan got word that Eddie Comiskey had been gunned down in a bar on 10th Avenue. Coonan knew he needed somebody to watch his back, and he had the perfect candidate in mind. Francis Mickey Featherstone is another one of these Hell's Kitchen archetypes who really became kind of a larger-than-life figure in the lore of the neighborhood. Mickey came from a large family. He was the last of nine kids, and he'd had sort of a troubled youth, and he joined the military, the Army, at a young age, the age of 16, and went off to Vietnam in the late 1960s. Mickey Featherstone tried to tell people that he was a combat veteran in Vietnam. Now, he was in the service during Vietnam, but he didn't see one minute of combat. He was in a supply station. But he came back here and told everybody that he was a combat veteran, and he didn't see one second of combat. Although Featherstone saw little combat, he witnessed violence and slaughter all around him. On his return, he avoided life imprisonment a few times. According to his lawyers, Featherstone was of unsound mind. Featherstone was establishing a kind of a, 
reputation as a uh, loose cannon in the neighborhood. And now he had created enough of a profile for himself in the neighborhood that Jimmy Coonan uh, recognized Mickey Featherstone as quite possibly a person who would be uh, good to have in his own organization, someone to be afraid of, someone who was maybe crazy enough to do almost anything. And so Coonan reached out to Mickey Featherstone and told him, look, if you're going to establish this kind of uh, reputation for yourself, at least use it to your advantage, use it in some kind of beneficial way. And so Coonan takes Featherstone under his wing, and Mickey becomes uh, Jimmy's right-hand man. They become the face of what would become known as the Westies in Hell's Kitchen. With Featherstone by his side, Jimmy Coonan made his move to take over the West Side, and within a year, his main rival, Mickey Spillane, was eliminated. Now Coonan was the boss of the Irish mob in Hell's Kitchen, but he wanted more, and soon developed a relationship with a mafia crew from Brooklyn. Coonan made an alliance with the Gambino family and began socializing with the Italians all over town. This brought Coonan to the attention of a man named Ruby Stein. Ruby Stein was known as the loan shark to the stars. And he hired Jimmy Coonan as his muscle and was seen around town often with Jimmy Coonan at his side. It was a great way for Jimmy Coonan to establish a profile all throughout the criminal underworld in New York City. Coonan and his crew owed big debts to Stein. Coonan came up with the idea to eliminate Ruby Stein. It was an incredibly audacious act for a young up-and-coming gangster in the city at that time. On May 5th, 1977, Jimmy Coonan brought Ruby Stein to the 596 Club, where his gang of Westies were waiting. One of the people that was there was a mafia capo associated with the Gambino crime family in Brooklyn. Coonan had selected the mafia hitman, Danny Grillo to pull the trigger on the Stein killing. Jimmy was smart enough to include a faction of the Gambino family in the act itself. Now, not only had he removed Ruby Stein, but there were people within the Gambino family that would have a vested interest in protecting Coonan. And they each put a bullet into the already dead corpse of Ruby Stein, but this was an act of, number one, making everyone who was there an accomplice in the murder, but also it was a kind of an oath, a kind of act of loyalty, an act of solidarity in which uh, Coonan and the gang members who were there at the time uh, were saying, we're all in this together. The Westie's initiation was completed by Jimmy Coonan when he demonstrated how to dismember a corpse. Jimmy Coonan took the skill uh, of dismemberment that he had learned from Eddie Kaminsky, and now he was going to initiate various members of the gang into the process of dismemberment. Some gang members were able to cross this line and, and some weren't. Mickey Featherstone wasn't able to stomach it and vomited during the cutting up of the body. Those who didn't have the strong enough stomach to handle this dismemberment were not uh, viewed as favorably as those who took to it with the kind of enthusiasm and relish that Jimmy Coonan did. Mickey Featherstone had now seen how far Jimmy Coonan was prepared to go to increase his power and wealth. But if he had any doubts about his boss, he kept them to himself, for now. There was a problem with the Ruby Stein murder, and that was that the torso, uh, Ruby Stein's torso, floated to the surface and washed ashore in the borough of Queens on Rockaway Beach. We only found the torso of his body, and we identified him from an appendicitis operation he had while he was in prison. 
and that's the only way we could identify him. They knew Coonan and Featherstone, they were the ones who killed and cut up Ruby Stein. The police could not officially link the Westies with Ruby Stein's murder. But they weren't the only ones who wanted to find out who killed him. Paul Castellano, who was the boss of the mafia at that time, the capo de tutti capi, the boss of all bosses, demanded a sit down with uh, the West Side Irish, with Jimmy Coonan. Coonan wasn't sure whether this was going to be the beginning of a beautiful relationship or if this was going to be the end of his life. So a group of the Westies were supposed to be on call. And if they didn't hear from Coonan by a certain designated time that they were supposed to arrive in Brooklyn with guns ablaze and kill everybody in sight, that was the plan. The appointed hour had come and gone with no word from Coonan. It was lucky for Coonan that the Westies were running late, or things could have turned out very differently. Now there was an affiliation between the Westies and the Mafia. This is what Coonan wanted, but not all of his crew were happy. Featherstone sees it as having formed a relationship with uh, our rivals, the Italians, and the generations had given their lives and fought hard to keep the Italians out of the neighborhood. In fact, Coonan himself had moved out of the neighborhood to a suburban neighborhood in New Jersey. Coonan was living in a big house that would be considered a mansion by the standards of Hell's Kitchen. Featherstone and others were still living in tenement apartments in the neighborhood. And this had created a kind of resentment within the gang that Jimmy Coonan didn't want to be an Irishman anymore, that he was uh, acting like he was an Italian. Now, the fact that they had formed this relationship with the Gambino family meant that they were now doing a lot of uh, criminal activity on behalf of the Gambino family. One particular murder contract they had been given was to take out a uh, union official. They'd come very close to shooting the guy on the waterfront, but the murder didn't happen, and uh, they were all frustrated about it, and they reconvened at a bar known as the Placa Bar. Tensions were running high in the gang, and that night while drinking in the Placa Bar on the Upper West Side, they met with a gangster called Harold Whitehead, or Whitey, as he was known. Jimmy Coonan had always had a beef with Whitey Whitehead, and uh, Whitehead went down into the basement restroom of the bar. A couple other members of the West, including Jimmy Coonan and Featherstone, went down there to smoke a joint in the restroom with Whitey Whitehead. Well, this was an unusual murder for Jimmy Coonan because it was stupid. It, it had no business connection whatsoever. It was an impulsive act on his part. They pulled Whitey Whitehead's pants down and pulled his pockets out, trying to make it look like it was a robbery. And they fled, and they left, they left his body there. And they'd left a lot of evidence related relating to that shooting, and it began a process of investigation of Coonan and Featherstone that would take the upper echelon of the Westies off the scene for a few years. Although they weren't convicted of Whitehead's murder, Coonan and Featherstone spent five years in jail for gun possession. While they were in jail, things went on as normal on the outside with Jimmy Coonan's wife, Edna, running the show. Jimmy Coonan's wife, Edna Coonan, was a tough customer herself. They'd been married for 10 years, and Edna Coonan had decided that she was going to be the one that was going to make the loan shark rounds and collect Jimmy Coonan's money. Tensions rose between Edna and Featherstone's wife, Sissy, as Edna wasn't happy sharing the money. 
This caused conflict between Coonan and Featherstone, and on Featherstone's release, he decided to leave Coonan and the Westies and do things his own way. Mickey Featherstone had pretty much come to the conclusion that he wanted out. He wanted to try to have some kind of a legitimate life for himself and his wife, but um, the criminal uh, underworld kept trying to pull him back in, and now he was back engaged in criminal activity in Hell's Kitchen. He was uh, drinking again. He was doing coke again. Here he was falling back into all his old ways, right back into criminal activity, and Mickey realized that he was never going to be clear of the neighborhood, really, as long as Jimmy Coonan was alive. Mickey Featherstone set about forming his own gang, and he was soon ready to take on Jimmy Coonan to try and take control of Hell's Kitchen. When Coonan was released from prison at the end of 1984, he set about regaining control of the West Side. The Italians convinced Coonan that Featherstone would have to go, but Coonan knew this would cause war on the streets of Hell's Kitchen. So he came up with a plan that would send Featherstone back to jail for good by framing him for a murder. Mickey Featherstone that day had been home in his apartment. He'd been on a bender the night before and he'd slept in late. And when he came in that afternoon to where he was working in his Teamsters job, a bunch of cops surrounded him and he was arrested. And he was taken into the precinct and he was put in a lineup and he was identified by witnesses who had seen the murder as the gunman, uh, the person who had shot and killed Michael Hawley that day. Coonan's plan had worked perfectly. With Featherstone's bad reputation, nobody believed his alibi and the authorities were quick to assume him guilty. Featherstone was brought to court in March 1986 and convicted. Facing a long prison term, he had two choices to keep his mouth shut or to open it. Faced with no other alternative, Featherstone made a decision that would bring about the end of the Westies. He betrayed them and went to work for the authorities. Mickey Featherstone lured a couple other members of the Westies to a meeting in the uh, visitor's room at the prison, and he got them to uh, divulge certain aspects of the Michael Hawley murder and a recorder had been planted in the visiting room. And so these recordings became the foundation of Mickey Featherstone, number one, getting his murder conviction overturned, and number two, paved the way for what eventually became his testimony against the Westies at a major trial that took place in late 1988 in New York City. Ten alleged members of the notorious Hell's Kitchen gang known as the Westies have been indicted. The charges range from loan sharking to kidnapping to murder. Spokesman for Manhattan's DA said convictions on the charges will crush the Westies as an organized crime enterprise. Trial proof showed that the Westies were a violent organized crime group that terrorized and exploited the Hell's Kitchen section of Manhattan for the last 20 years. All of America watched the trial of Jimmy Coonan and his criminal gang. That trial was an extraordinary event. I attended it myself almost every day of the trial. It lasted five months. And in the course of this trial, you would see a lot of neighborhood people from Hell's Kitchen come to witness what, what was really the end of a, a entire history of Irish-American gangsterism in the city of New York. Jimmy Coonan was given a sentence of 75 years in jail. He's currently held in Lewisburg Penitentiary. Mickey and Sissy Featherstone disappeared into the witness protection scheme. They're still living under assumed identities. The Westies were the last real Irish gangsters in New York. The Irish mob was now reaching the end of its life. But it wasn't dead yet. <laughs>